start uh, YouTube. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Suprita, ma please go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. A very good afternoon to one and all. I am Ms. Suprita Naik. Welcome you all on behalf of Zoology Department of Mahashi Dayanand College of Arts, Science and Commerce to the Women of Matter talk series celebrating 75th year of independence. Azadika Amrit Mahutsa in collaboration with Envis Second Tamil Nadu. I take this opportunity to welcome you all and our respected dignitaries, Dr. Chaya Pansi, Madam, Principal of MD College, Dr. Golding Quadra, Sir, Principal Scientist, Second Tamil Nadu, our Honorable Speaker, Dr. Yedna uh, Parvati, Ma'am, Dr. Vaishai Somani, Madam, Head of Zoology Department, and all my dear participants. I am indeed, uh, I am indeed uh, delighted to welcome you all on behalf of Zoology Department for today's event. May I now request our Principal Madam to please address the gathering. Madam, over to you. Thank you, Suprita. Uh, respected uh, Head of the Zoology Department, Dr. Vaishali Somni, Principal Scientist of SACON, Mr. Golden Kordros, uh, our guest for today, Mrs. Uh, Dr. Yadnya Parvate, Dear students and all the members of SACON, wish you all a good afternoon. Today, our resource person is not new to MD College. Dr. Yadnya has put in a lot of efforts in MD College. She has worked in MD College up to 2005 for about four or five years she was with us. And uh, she knows MD College in and out. In fact, she always says MD College is her first home. Now, for those for last 15 years, she is with DY Patil College, handling the uh, Department of Biotechnology. But her love for MD has is still there. She, I just met her last uh, few days back. She had come to college. Uh, uh, Yadna, madam, uh, as you are aware that we are celebrating 75th year of Amrit Mahotsav. And for this, we are collaborating with Envis Sakon and uh, principal scientist from M Envis Sakon, Dr. Golden Quadros, who is already here, is instrumental for, uh, for initiating this idea with MD College. And I'm proud to tell you that we have uh, finished, I think this is the 75th lecture which you are going to give and then after that we will be okay. and we will be summarizing the program and uh, uh, i'm happy that you are an oceanographist you have come done your post graduation in oceanography and today you're going to talk about living in between tides uh, this one more speciality of this program is that we have all lady speakers all 75 speakers were women and we call them women of matter. And you are also one of the women of matter. I'm not telling you much about either of MD College because you know MD College. But just to give you what happened after 2005 is we have started with many self-financing courses like computer science, the Bachelor in Accounts and Financing, Bachelor of Financial Markets, Mass Media, then uh, BMS and different these courses we have started. We started MCOM, we have PhD not only in chemistry and zoology, but now we have PhD in Hindi, English, Marathi, Mathematics, Commerce and Management. And our college caters to about 9,000 students. And uh, in sports and drama, we are doing excellent. And for last consecutive years, a uh, few years, I think seven, eight years, Mr. and Miss University is from our college. In 2014-15, we were awarded the best college by Mumbai University. Similarly, last year, an organization from Bangalore also awarded us as the best college for leading infrastructure and online teaching during pandemic. This year, we got the uh, Swachh Vidyalay Puruskar from central government. And uh, you all already know that we have completed three cycles of NAC. The last cycle, we had A grade. Now, we will be entering the fourth cycle. 
Uh, very soon, within another four or five months, we will be uh, putting up uh, our, our SSR report. And uh, I would like to tell you all that in the zoology department, there is a very beautiful museum which is made of shells. And during the last NAC, Yatna Madam was very instrumental in making that uh, museum, which people are admiring even today. And, and that collection was wonderful collection of shells by all of us during the excursions. And we have displayed it. So thank you, Yadna Madam, uh, for that beautiful uh, collection, which is there in the uh, zoology department. And on behalf of MD College and SACON, I welcome you to our institute. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam, for such a wonderful onset of the program. Now I would like to invite Dr. Ms. Gayatri Hegde to introduce our today's guest speaker to all our dear parts. Gayatri, Madam, over to you. Thank you, Subdita, ma'am. It is a pleasure to welcome our today's guest. Dr. Yadna A. Paravati. She has done her PhD uh, in biotechnology from D.Y. Patil Team to be University. She is currently working as an assistant professor in the same D.Y. Patil uh, Institute. And uh, prior to that, she has been a lecturer at our own MD college since uh, July 2002 to April 2005. Uh, she has also guided many research students, around 20 students of PG and UG courses. Uh, and she is also a PhD guide in her own school. Uh, she has also, she has 24 years of uh, experience in academics in teaching, uh, and her uh, in, her interest in uh, her interest uh, her interest in research is very diverse, and she has also uh, publications in many journals which are very reputed. So I would like to invite our today's guest, Dr. Yadna Madam, to start her session. Thank you so much for that warm welcome and thank you so much Panse Ma'am for that loving address and for updating me on the recent achievements of our college. As you truly mentioned, MD has always been my home and it shall remain always. So with that words, I now share the screen. Okay, is my screen seen? Yes, ma'am, it's visible. Okay, okay, okay. So I'll start off with the presentation. Okay, how can I move this particular? Yes, madam. I would like to move this grid. Okay, okay. So now, a very good afternoon to one and all, and a warm welcome to the talk on living between the tides. As we all are aware, the intertidal zone is the area between the mean low tide and the mean high tide levels. So as you can see, this is the low tide mark and this is the high tide mark. So the area in between these two tide levels constitutes the intertidal zone. Now, this particular zone happens to be covered with water at high tide and it is exposed to air at the time of low tide. The land or the substratum of this particular area can either be constituted by rocks or it can be constituted by sand or it can be covered by mud flats. The interesting point to note is that this particular intertidal zone is occupied by a plethora of living organisms and these organisms inhabiting the intertidal zones literally leave their lives governed by the tides. So obviously, that leads to the question as to what are tides? Tides are the rise and fall of sea levels caused by the combined effects of the gravitational forces exerted by the moon and the sun on the rotating earth. So whenever the water extends to the maximum extent on the shoreline, we state that it is high tide. On the other hand, Whenever the water recedes down to the maximum extent on the shoreline, we refer to it as low tide. And mind well, 
it is as per the timing of these tides that the inhabitants of the intertidal zone have to plan their day-to-day -day activities. So with that background information in mind, oh, how can I just uh, close this grid so that I can see the presentation completely? Yeah, yeah, it's done. Thank you so much. So now with that background information in mind, let us understand the characteristic features of the intertidal zone. Now, most of the organisms of the intertidal zone are small and uncomplicated. This fact facilitates their survival in these harsh environmental conditions. The intertidal zone is rich in nutrients and oxygen as they are replenished with each tide. So every fresh wave of tide brings along with it abundance of food, abundance of nutrients. So there is never a dearth of food in the intertidal zone. Now, most of the nutrients which are brought in are comprised of living organisms. And most of the living organisms which are brought in along with the fresh wave of tides are represented by planktons, both phytoplanktons as well as zooplanktons. Now, the number of these planktons which are brought in by the waves is much more than the numbers required to feed the organisms inhabiting the intertidal zone. So in short and sweet terms, there is abundance of food in the intertidal zone. The interesting fact to note is that this food which is brought into the intertidal zone is not necessarily constituted by living organisms. But then, dead plants and animals also find entry into the intertidal zone and help in feeding scavengers like hermit crabs and show crabs. So that is how we have both grazing food chains starting from producers as well as detritus food chain starting from detritus that is dead and decaying organic matter. We have both of these varieties of food chains represented in the intertidal zone and they are cross-linked at various points giving rise to unique food webs which are characteristic of the zone. Now, the most outstanding characteristic feature of the intertidal zone is its dynamism. What do I mean by that? The intertidal zone is constantly redesigned by three forces, wind, water, and rocks. So with the onset of high tide, the water splashes against the rocks with great amount of force, with great amount of pressure. Now, the very strong winds which blow over this area of the sea further adds to the force exerted by the onslaught of this tidal waves on the rock. As a result of this, the rocks get eroded gradually and chips of sediments loosen from the rocks and they are carried away by the waves. The point I'm trying to put across is that this particular area of intertidal zone is highly dynamic and these three forces that is wind, water and rock are continuously in action keeping on changing the environment and responsible for its dynamism. So now let us understand the zonation pattern of the intertidal zone. It's interesting to note that there are four distinct zones recognized within the intertidal zone, which from bottom up are the low tide zone, the mid tide zone, the high tide zone, and the splash zone. Now, each of the zones has its own peculiar characteristics. So, let us understand them. Starting off with the low tide zone. Now, the low tide zone is the area of the intertidal zone which is closest to the sea and it is submerged under water for majority of time. Now, what does that mean? When I say this area is submerged under water for majority of time, it clearly indicates that it is exposed to the scorching heat of the sun or it is exposed to the air for minimal duration of time. As a result of this, it is said that the environmental conditions in this particular patch of intertidal zone are less drastic due to lesser fluctuations in salinity, temperature, 
and most importantly maximum duration of time the zone is under water and that is the reason why this particular zone exhibits greatest species diversity since a large variety of organisms are in a position to thrive in the low tide zone of the intertidal area as is very evident from this particular diagram moving up on to the mid tide zone now mid tide zone as the name itself indicates is the area between the average high tide zone and the low tide zone so this is an area which is submerged under water for half of the time and exposed to air for the remaining half of the time in other words you can state that the mid tide zone is covered and uncovered by the sea water smoothly twice a day with each time so the organisms which occupy this particular area would be submerged under water for half of the time and they would be exposed to air for half of the time so goes without saying they are required to be more specialized than the organisms inhabiting the low tide zone that is precisely the reason why we find lesser species diversity in the mid tide zone as compared to your low tide zone moving ahead the high tide zone which is the next zone is also referred to as the upper tide zone thus this zone is submerged under water only during the high tide which means that this particular zone is exposed to the air for a larger duration of time and that is the reason why it presents with harsher environmental conditions and only a few plant and animal species are able to survive in this particular region now most of the organisms which manage to survive in this region in this particular region are those which can gain a firm anchorage to the rocks as you can see over here in the slide you have barnacles you have limpets you have rats all of this can gain a firm attachment to the rock so you have two types of creatures inhabiting this zone either those which can gain attachment to the substrate or those which are mobile which can move around in search of food or can hide themselves at appropriate places in times of danger so organisms like crabs which are mobile can be found inhabiting the high tide zone moving ahead and that is with the splash zone Now the splash zone is located above your upper tide zone or high tide zone, and this particular zone experiences splashes of water coming from the waves during the high tide. So as the high tide begins to rise, or rather as the water begins to rise during high tide, and it reaches its optimum level on the seashore, splashes of water do sprinkle over the splash zone. In fact. what is required to be understood is that in the splash zone we only receive splashes of water the entire zone is never wetted like your high tide zone and that's precisely the reason why it is referred to as splash zone fine right? now the characteristic feature of splash zone is that it is faced with the scorching heat of the sun for most of the time the wetting occurs intermittently and that is the reason why this zone presents with the most harsh environmental conditions so you have limited species diversity in this particular zone and those organisms which inhabit this zone are highly specialized and unique so that's about zonation exhibited by your intertidal zone now it's pretty interesting to note that the intertidal zone puts forth several challenges in front of its inhabitants we have listed the most pertinent ones amongst the same the first and foremost challenge which is presented by the intertidal zone happens to be the problem of desiccation so when exposed that is when exposed to the air the organisms inhabiting the zone exhibit severe water loss due to drying up now if i go back to the previous slide it is very evident that as you move up from the low tide zone to the mid tide zone to the high tide zone and towards the splash zone so as you move gradually from the low tide zone to the splash zone the period of exposure to the air 
keeps on increasing and thereby the danger of getting desiccated also keeps on increasing. So what is essential to be understood is that all the organisms occupying the different zones of your intertidal area need to develop adaptations in order to minimize water loss and prevent dry -nerm. The next important challenge thrown at these organisms is temperature extremes. There are extreme fluctuations in the temperature of the intertidal zone, and these are influenced by time of the day and status of the tide. Now, what do I mean by that? At the time of high tide, as the shoreline gets covered by water, the temperatures drop. On the other hand, at the time of low tide, as the water uncovers the seashore, the temperatures arise. And in certain areas, in certain geographical locations, these differences in temperature can be as high as 20 degrees Celsius between the tides, which are apart by just six hours. So that itself tells us that how wide the temperature fluctuations can be and how the organisms would be required to adapt to the same. Just like temperature, there is a very wide range of salinity changes also occurring in the intertidal zone. Now, these changes are both diurnal as well as seasonal. So seasonally, it's very simple to understand that depending upon the extent of rainfall which we receive during the rainy season, there will be dilution of seawater. So higher the rains, more would be the dilution of seawater and lesser would be the salinity. On the other extreme, during summer season, due to the scorching heat of the sun, there will be excessive evaporation of water. And this would constitute to an increase in the salinity of seawater. So at one extreme, the salinity may dip due to excessive rains. At the other extreme, it can rise due to evaporation of water. Now, this is with reference to seasonal variation. Daily or routine diurnal variations also occur in salinity. So at any particular time of the day, when discharge is actually received in the form of fresh water from land, the salinity of the seawater gets reduced. It is dropped as the seawater gets diluted by fresh water. On the other hand, during midday, as the sun reaches its zenith, there is excessive evaporation of water occurring, which results in increase in salinity. So overall, the salinity can drop in extreme cases to as much as 5 parts per thousand, and it can rise up to 35 parts per thousand in the intertidal zone. So that is how its inhabitants have to adapt themselves to these fluctuations in salinity. Further, the organisms it, which are inhabiting the intertidal zone exhibit interrupted feeding. So animals inhabiting the zone have restricted feeding times. What do I mean by that? These organisms are required to align their feeding times with the timings of the tides. For example, if we talk about sessile animals, that is the organisms which attach themselves to the substratum, which are acting as filter feeders, these organisms can feed only at the time of high tide. So as the high tide brings in numerous planktons, what these organisms do is they filter the water and take up the planktons selectively. So obviously, this feeding activity can be carried out only at the time of high tide. The organisms would be unable to feed when the tide is out. So that's why I mentioned that the organisms have interrupted and restricted feeding times which are aligned with the timing of the tides. Now, those animals that are not filter feeders may also be restricted in their feeding times as they seek shelter from the elements and predators at low tide. Now, what do I mean by that? In order to escape the scorching heat of the sun, these organisms may avoid feeding at low tides or they may align their feeding times in such a manner that they are safe from the scorching heat of the sun as well as from the predators. Moving ahead, wave action and tides is yet another challenge imposed on the organisms of intertidal zone. The waves hit the intertidal zone with force 
and may dislodge organisms from their habitat. Now, a lot of organisms gain firm attachment to the substratum of the intertidal zone and see to it that they are not dislodged. However, due to the excessive onslaught of the waves, which occurs with great force, organisms do get dislodged from their habitat. Yet another challenge happens to be oxygen availability and buildup of carbon dioxide. Now, the oxygen content can become exhausted if the organisms clam up during low tide. I'm sure many of you would be aware that mussels exhibit this particular characteristic of clamming up, wherein a lot of mussels are going to aggregate and attach themselves to the rocky substratum, wherein they try and reduce the surface area of their body, which is exposed to the sun, thereby trying to avoid desiccation, trying to avoid getting dried up. However, in this particular activity, what happens is a large number of organisms happen to occupy a particular area within the intertidal zone. So since a lot of organisms are present per square feet area or per unit area of that particular zone, soon the oxygen content of that area declines and there is a rise in the level of carbon dioxide to toxic levels. So that is yet another challenge imposed by the intertidal zone on its inhabitants. Last but not the least, the organisms inhabiting this particular zone have to compete for space. They face the problem of limited space. Now, what do I mean by that? Space constraints arise due to aggregation of animals in limited areas, which offer cover in these harsh environmental conditions. So be it the underside of the rocks or the rises of the rocks or any area which is considered to be safe from the onslaught of waves, any area which is considered to be safe from the scorching heat of the sun, these areas would be excessively occupied by the organisms. There'll be aggregation of organisms in such areas, thereby resulting in competition for space. So that is how the intertidal zone is going to present its inhabitants with a variety of challenges. Moving ahead. Now, based on the nature of substratum, the intertidal zone can have different habitats. The habitat which has been shown in this figure happens to be the rocky shore. So here the substratum is predominantly rocks. Now, it's important to understand that the rocks offer little protection from the strong waves. Okay, so the animals residing in this particular substratum type of the intertidal zone, they have to adapt themselves to anchor to the rocks very, very firmly. So if you have a look at this figure, we have shown a variety of plants and animals here. We have shown kelps, sea lettuces, barnacles, mussels, periwinkles, all of these organisms occupying the rocky intertidal zone areas have adapted themselves to adhere very firmly to the rocks. It's further interesting to note that within the rocky shores, as the water moves out, as, in, as the high tide recedes, there is accumulation of water in between the rocks, wherever there are shallow areas in between the rocks. And this results in the development of complex tide pools. So what is interesting to note that you have a large variety of organisms inhabiting these pools which are found in between the rocky shores. They are referred to as tide pools. So as you can see from the diagram, you have a variety of seaweeds which gain attachment to the rocks. And they attach in such a manner that some part of their body is still immersed in water so that they can maintain moisture content. So that is how these seaweeds offer protection from drying to a variety of organisms who take shelter by attaching themselves to these weeds or hiding underneath them. So the point I'm trying to put across is that the substratum which is presented by the rocky shoes is predominantly rocks. And in between the rocks, you have complex tide pool. And each of this, exhibits complex food chains resulting in unique food webs.
comprising of a very wide variety of marine organisms. Now, the next type of substratum is so seen to be, you can see the sandy or the mud flats, the sandy beaches or the mud flats. They are the other variety of substratum which is observed in the intertidal zone. Now, unlike the first substratum which we talked about, that is rocks, these areas, these substrates offer a lot of nutrients within them, but then they offer very little spaces for attachment. This is exactly opposite to your rocky shores. Rocky shores presents with great surface area for attachment. Unlike that, within the sandy beaches or within the muddy shores, there is very little attachment available in the form of plants. These plants in turn anchor to those substrates which are firm, which are very few in number. So the point I'm trying to put across is that due to this nature of substratum, which is very loose, most of the organisms inhabiting the sandy beaches or the mud flats have adapted themselves to bury deep down into the sand or into the mud flats so that they are safe. So at the time of high tide, these organisms bury themselves and at the time of low tide, they come out for feeding. So there are two major adaptations exhibited by the organisms who reside in sandy or muddy beaches. They have to bury themselves in the sand or mud or gain attachment to the plants, which manage to gain attachment to some firm substratum. So the point I'm trying to put across is that intertidal zone or intertidal area can either have rock as its substratum or it can have mud flats as its substratum or it can have sand as its substratum. Now, depending upon the nature of substratum, the type of organisms found and the adaptations which they put up would vary. Well, now that we have a clear picture about the environmental peculiarities of the intertidal zone in our mind, I believe it is the right time for us to understand the adaptations undergone by organisms inhabiting different zones of this particular habitat. I hope you people remember that the species diversity tends to decline from the low tide zone to the mid tide zone, from there to the high tide zone, and from there to the splash zone. The reason behind that being the environmental conditions get harsher and harsher as you ascend upwards from the low tide zone towards the splash zone. The point I'm trying to make is that although the species diversity declines bottom up, we have chosen five representative examples of organisms from each of these zones in order to get a flair of the adaptations they exhibit. I hope that point is well taken. So now we start off with the adaptations exhibited by organisms living in the low tide zone. Now this zone, as we had seen earlier, is exposed to air for a very less duration of time. It remains underwater for a much longer period of time. So what kind of organisms do you find here? You have chitons. As you can see in this particular figure, this is a black catty chiton. So the dorsal side of its body shows the presence of shell with eight flexible plates. The ventral side of the body has a muscular foot. So with the help of that, it adheres itself very firmly to the rock. And the shell is going to clamp itself very tightly onto the surface of the rock. So the adaptations exhibited by chitin are the ability to adhere or to cling to the rocks very powerfully. It's interesting to note that chitons can withstand very, you can say, high action of waves. However, by chance, if they happen to get dislodged from the rocks, what do they do? By chance, if they get dislodged from the rocks, chitons have the ability to roll up into a ball, all covered by their chitinous shell, which offers protection to them from the predators. So that is how chitin manages to survive in this harsh environment. Moving on to the next example, tube worm. Now, tube worms have extremely soft bodies. So what they do? 
they build hard tubes around their soft bodies for protection from their harsh environmental conditions. Moving on further, and that is with sea slugs. Now, what we have shown over here in this figure is an opalescent nudibranch, which is nothing but a sea slug. So what do the sea slugs do for survival? They camouflage themselves with the surrounding environment. So they have beautiful colors and these colors blend with their surroundings so that they are not easily sighted by the predators. Another interesting adaptation of sea slugs is that they retain the fold testing poison stings of their prey in their body. So if at all they are threatened by a predator, what they do is they literally secrete out this poison stings as a defensive action against the predators. And that is how they are successful most of the times in escaping from the predators. Yet another beautiful example of adaptation is exhibited by sea cucumber. Now the one which I've shown in this particular figure happens to be an orange sea cucumber. So what do the sea cucumbers do? When disturbed, they may expel their internal organs, leaving those for the predator, while they escape out from the scene and regrow those organs back later. So just imagine the scene. If some predator is trying to attack a sea cucumber, what will it do? It will give out most of its internal organs in a fraction of a second. So that would obviously startle the predator and it would be taken aback. Moreover, it would be happy to feed on all those internal organs which have been presented to it. And in the meanwhile, the sea cucumber will escape from the sea and grow back its organs which were discarded. That's quite an interesting adaptation. Next, we have eelgrass. Now, let me tell you, eelgrass is not just found in the low tide zone. You will also find it in certain other zones of this intertidal area. It is because it is very well adapted to this particular environmental conditions. First of all, it is urihaline. It has a very wide salt tolerance. And secondly, it has very severe and strong strategy to resist the energy of the waves. What do I mean by that? The rhizomes, that is the modified stems, or the roots of the eelgrass enable them to gain a firm anchorage over the substratum. Secondly, they show the presence of flexible leaf blades. So these flexible leaf blades happen to bend in the direction of flow of water. So that is how minimum damage is caused to the eelgrass and it manages to survive in the low tide zone. So this was with reference to adaptations of organisms inhabiting the low tide zone. Now we take the story ahead and that is with adaptations exhibited by organisms inhabiting the middle tide zone. Now organisms in this particular zone have to tolerate both submersion in water and exposure to air alternatively twice a day, as we already discussed. So what organisms do we have here? You have wrinkled whelks. So obviously the snails inside the shell is going to love moisture. So it will come out to feed only when the environmental conditions are favorable. And when they are not, what does it do? They retract the food into their shell and cover the opening of the shell by operculum. So the operculum works like a door to tightly seal the opening of the shell, preventing the organism from drying, at the same time conserving its body moisture content. So that's quite an interesting adaptation. The sea stars or the starfishes possess tube feet. Now these tube feet are of dual benefit to the organism. When the organism wants to move around in search of food, the tube feet come handy as they help as they serve as their locomotory organs. And when the organism wants to gain a firm anchorage to its substratum, which is predominantly rocks, the tube feet, due to their suction pressure, enables the organism to anchor very firmly to the rocks. So that is how the tube feet helps the organism in both the ways. It enables the organism to move around in search of food 
as it enables it to locomote and it also enables it to adhere very firmly to the rock by means of the suction pressure which it applies. Now, the sea star which has been shown in this figure happens to pizaster, has happens to be pizaster sea star. Now, it's interesting to note that this pizaster sea star has this particular adaptation wherein it can withstand exposure to air as long as eight long hours. So it's highly adapted to live in the middle tide zone. Next, we have interesting organisms that is sea animals. Now, we all are aware that the sea animals attach themselves to the larger rocks with the help of their base. What is more interesting to note that at the apical or free surface of the sea animals, you have an array of tentacles. And these tentacles literally inject a paralyzing neurotoxin whenever the sea animals are threatened, when they are touched or when they feel they are in danger. So that is a defensive mechanism put up by the sea animals to survive in these harsh environmental conditions. As I mentioned earlier, eel grass is found in more than one zone of your intertidal zones due to its supreme adaptations, which we had discussed earlier. The next category of organisms which you have in the middle tide zone are the Betillaria snails. Now, these Betillaria snails partially bury themselves in the mud to avoid drying up or desiccation at the time of low tide. So, they are partially under the sand and partially exposed to it. So, that is how they protect themselves from getting dried up and manage to survive in this harsh environmental condition. Next, we move on to organisms in the upper tide zone. Now, these animals must be able to survive long periods of exposure to air. As we had discussed earlier, this particular area, this particular zone of your intertidal area is going to be submerged underwater only during high tides. So, for the remaining duration of time, it is exposed to the air. So, the organisms need to develop adaptations to sustain that exposure. So, what type of organisms do we have here? We have limpets. Now, limpets shape their shells to fit a specific rock. So, depending upon the nature of shape of the rock, the limpets will exactly fit the shape of the cell over the surface. And that acts as an effective seal against water loss. So, what they are doing is they are literally sealing themselves on the surface of the rock so that there is no desiccation or drying up akin. Once again, you have sea animals represented in the upper tide zone also. The adaptations which they present enable them to survive not just in the mid tide zone, but so also in the upper tide zone. Moving on further. And that is with the barnacles. I'm sure you all must have seen barnacles sometimes or the other in your life. So what are the adaptations put up by barnacles? Barnacles secrete a natural glue and cling themselves very tightly to the rocks. So this very tight gluing of the barnacles to the rocks is by virtue of the natural glue. I'm sure you all are aware that barnacles have impermeable calcareous shells surrounding them, which offers protection. These shells have two plates at its apical surface. Point I'm trying to make is that these two plates are closed when the organism is not feeding and they open up when the organism wants to feed. So that is how the barnacles manage to survive in the appetite zone. Moving ahead with the shore crabs. The shore crabs have interesting adaptations. They possess a very hard exoskeleton. So the shell or the carapace is very hard. So it obviously offers protection against the scorching heat of the sun. It offers protection against getting dry up. At the same time, the shore crabs exhibit concealing coloration. What do you mean by that? The coloration of the body of shore crabs is such that they are not easily visible against their background. So this enables the show crab to move about freely in search of food in order to keep themselves obviously healthy. So that's the adaptation of show crabs. 
Last but not the least, we talk about rock weeds. Now, what are rock weeds? These are basically seaweeds that have special structures called as hold fast, by which they attach themselves to the rocks. So, this hold fast are structures which gives the seaweeds a very firm anchorage to the rocks so that they are not going to be carried away by the action of waves. So, these are the interesting adaptations of organisms inhabiting the upper tide zone. Moving further, with the adaptations of organisms residing in the splash zone. I hope you'll remember, the splash zone is a transitional area between the land and the sea. So it's obviously harsh and inhospitable area, wherein only very few specialized organisms can inhabit or can survive. So let us understand what kind of organisms are found in the splash zone and what are their adaptations? We we'll start off with a lichen. Now, I'm pretty sure you all are aware that lichen is a mutualistic association between an alga and a fungus. So, the algal component of this association helps with synthesis of food, and the fungal component protects from harsh environmental conditions. So, you would naturally ask how? So, this fungal component has a very thick upper cover. So that offers protection against temperature fluctuations or any other kind of harsh environmental conditions. And the middle part of the body of the fungus has reservoirs to store water. So that is how the fungus component is providing protection and also helping in storage of water. And the algal component is synthesizing food. So cumulatively, they are able to survive themselves in this harsh environmental conditions. Moving on further with the isopods. Now, isopods are crustaceans which are commonly found hiding in the algae or the kelps or under the rocks. So, these are smart creatures. What do they do? They take benefit of other organisms residing in that area which are known to retain moisture in their body, such as algae and kelps. So, they would hide underneath the algae and kelps, thereby protecting themselves from the scorching heat of the sun. Or they may take cover on the lower surfaces of the rocks, which are less exposed and hence still retain some moisture content. Taking the story ahead, that is with the blue-green algae. Now, the blue-green algae secrete a sticky mucilaginous sheath around their body. Now, this sticky mucilaginous sheath serves two purposes. It prevents the body of organism from getting desiccated or drying up. At the same time, it prevents friction between the body of the blue-green algae and the rock. So, it prevents damage to its own body and at the same time, it prevents the drying up by secreting this mucilaginous sheath around itself. Next in the series, we have periwinkles. Now, periwinkles hide in the crevices of the rocks. What are periwinkles? These are gastropods which have small sized shells. So you'll find variety of periwinkles in the splash zone of the intertidal area. So they generally hide themselves in the crevices of the rocks whenever the scorching heat of the sun travels them. Plus, they secrete mucus to prevent drying. You may wonder how. The mucus which is secreted by these organisms covers the opening of their shell. So, it helps in retaining the moisture which is present within the shell. At the same time, it also enables the snail or the organism within to get a firm anchorage onto the rocks. So, those are the adaptations exhibited by periwinkles. Last but not the least, we have amphipodes. Now, it's interesting to note that although we are discussing amphipods in the splash zones, even amphipods can be found in the other zones of your intertidal habitat. And the reason behind their success across the different zones is that they can tolerate low oxygen levels for considerable duration of time, which enables them to tide over these harsh environmental conditions and live happily. So I'm sure you all would appreciate that how the intertidal environment, in spite of being extremely harsh, is occupied by a plethora of organisms, each of which has managed to survive in this particular environment 
by virtue of the special adaptations that they exhibit. Now, I'm sure you all are aware that we humans do not live any habitat untouched, isn't it? We manage to create nuisance in practically every habitat we can visit. And the intertidal zone is no exception. So let us understand what are the threats presented to the intertidal zone by human beings. Now, humans often harvest animals and plants from the intertidal zones for food, bait, and aquarium. A lot of intertidal organisms are cherished as food by the humans. Some are used as bait and some are also used in the aquarium. Now, what happens as you take these animals out of their habitat? Their chances of survival outside the intertidal zone are very low. Moreover, picking them out of their habitat damages the ecosystem in an irreversible manner, causing decline in their biodiversity. Apart from this, numerous shell types, especially those of marine mollusks, are beautiful and valued by the collectors. So it goes without saying that these shells are collected in large numbers, thereby causing a decline in their numbers due to heavy collection. Last but not the least, the coastal pollution which is caused by discarded trash Unfortunately, a major component of this trash is constituted by plastics, apart from which you have accidents such as oil spills, sewage spills, which adds to the existing trouble. And then you have variety of chemicals given off, toxic chemicals given off as runoff from land, all of which eventually find its way into the sea. And when I say sea, the very first area of the sea which gets affected is obviously the intertidal zone. So it has a very severe negative impact on the life of the organisms inhabiting the intertidal area. So all in all, we humans literally post a lot of threats to the intertidal zone. Now, just understanding what are the threats is not sufficient. Let us try and understand what can be done in order to conserve this beautiful habitat. First and foremost, things do not collect seashells. See, as zoologists, we all are fond of collecting shells, isn't it? Even I have done that as a student. But I would say we should refrain from doing that, as these shells can house hermit crabs. In fact, they can also act as substrates for attachment of other organisms, thereby increasing the chances of survival. So we should avoid collecting seashells, even though they are empty. Apart from that, we should minimize this charge of pollutants of all sorts into these areas to retain their biodiversity. And last but not the least, we should participate in beach cleanup programs to prevent trash from the polluting coastal and intertidal habitats from increasing in volume and damaging the organisms living within it. So I'm sure this last measure we all can participate in and do our bit in helping to conserve this beautiful and dynamic habitat. I would like to conclude my presentation with this verse. Battered by waves and scorched by sun, hither and thither with the tides we run. Floods and droughts in a cycle we have spun, dynamic yet evolving, our life is spun. So that is how living between the tides actually is. Thank you so much for your attention. Questions are welcome. Thank you so much, Yadna ma'am, for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, the participants who would like to ask any question can either unmute themselves or they can put their questions in the chat box. Participants are requested to put their questions in chat box. That was a wonderful session, Yadna madam. Thank you so much. And I think many of Thank our students, you. they are having this topic also in their syllabus, intertidal. Okay, okay. So, so that I was not aware of. We have completed the marine portion for us. <laughs> yeah. Even PG students, uh, they will uh, have a good view of entire intertidal zone. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful session. Thank you, Thank you so much. 
So can I stop screen sharing? Yes, yes, madam, you can stop screen sharing. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sanika Gupta, madam, uh, for joining. Sanika Gupta, madam, is faculty member of uh, Zoology Department, Hindunala College. We had a sh oh, shared YouTube link with them as you are alumni you. member of Junjunwala. Those students thank also you, thank you so much. benefited. Yeah. yeah. Many of our students will watch it on YouTube, madam, later. Okay. Because okay. they have some connectivity issue. Uh, okay. So, Prita, thank madam, you, is there any uh, student over here who would like to ask question? Yes, ma'am. We have one student who wants to ask the question. I'm just unmuting for him. Just okay. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, as it was a very wonderful session. Uh, and the thing is, we have marine biology as an applied component. We have learned very interesting facts about it and more the species we have studied. Thank you so much, ma'am. Most welcome. Uh, ma'am, my question is, uh, can you tell me about macrofauna? Sorry? Uh, can you tell me about macrofauna? Micro or macro? Macro. Macro. So all we discussed was about macrofauna, organisms which are seen with the naked eye and which are living in the intertidal zone, isn't it? Most of the adaptations which we discussed, in fact, all of the adaptations which we discussed were about macrofauna. Microfauna is constituted by your zooplanktons, which are also found in abundance. But as I mentioned, most of the adaptations which we discussed were pertaining to the macrofauna. Uh, well, now, if there are more questions, maybe I could take it later also. If there are no questions now, doesn't matter. You can mail me the questions yeah, and yes, I'll be madam, happy take to address later. them. Yeah. yeah. Now, if there are questions yeah. now, I'll be happy to take. If not, I can take it later as well. Uh, Ma'am, can you share, share your experience about visiting or conducting any activities for uh, prevention of uh, intertidal zone or conservation of? See, I have not participated in any beach cleaning activity. In fact, uh, I have been a human of nuisance to the intertidal zone because uh, <laughs> I have collected a lot of shells and shell collection was my hobby. In fact, Pansi Madam also mentioned in the welcome address that how I have prepared a shell museum for our department. I was a part of that particular process of preparing the shell museum. So as zoologists, we generally tend to go out to visit the beaches and collect shells from different kinds of beaches, maybe rocky, sandy, muddy. Each of these beaches offers with different variety of shells. So my participation till date has always been in collecting shells. But then now at this walk of life, I realize that if we do that, we are only participating in declining the species diversity. So henceforth, if I get an opportunity, I would certainly like to participate in some of the beach cleanup activities. Okay, thank you. I hope it answers your question. Yeah, nice session, Yadna. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. And I said, okay, no need of teaching anything now in marine biology. You have covered everything. <laughs> that was a wonderful compliment, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Yadnya, ma'am. May I now request uh, my colleague, Dr. Harshida Kodi, madam, to give a vote of thanks. Thank you, Suprita, madam. Uh, I take this opportunity to thank our admiring speaker, Ms. Yadna Parvate, Madam, for sparing her valuable time and joining us to share her expertise in marine ecosystem. Your expertise on zonation of intertidal region, challenges faced by the organisms, and their conservation was commendable, Madam, and very much appreciable. Thank you for such a beautiful presentation. I would also like to extend my gratitude towards MDC, Kaval Verma, Madam, and our principal, Pansa Madam, for their constant support to bring up such programs. I would also like to thank Dr. Golding Quadros, sir, and all the members of MVSECON. I would like 
to thank uh, my teacher colleagues from zoology department for their coordination and support in bringing this event successfully arshada cannot I hear you want to thank ayya arshada sopnil sir and rajesh sir for arshada cannot hear you and last but not but not least i would like to thank all the students and other participants from different places who who had joined us on zoom and youtube thank you so much all of you thank you so much for inviting it was a great pleasure being here yeah thank you thank you thank you bye and see you soon thank you thank yes ma'am so see you soon wonderful yes. session yeah thank you yeah uh, you must sir please stop live streaming i